country caused by their space activities or those of their nationals. Section 36 of the 2018 Act requires persons carrying out spaceflight activities to indemnify the UK government and a number of named public bodies against any claims brought against the government or bodies in respect of damage or loss arising out of or in connection with those spaceflight activities. However, this is subject to any limit on the amount of an operator's liability specified in their licence, except in prescribed circumstances such as where the operator is liable in respect of gross negligence or willful misconduct. The 2018 Act currently provides powers for the regulator to specify a limit on the amount of the operator's liability in their licence, but the Act does not make it mandatory. Currently, Section 12.2 of that Act provides that an operator licence may specify a limit on the amount of a licensee's liability to indemnify under Section 36, but this contrasts with Regulation 20, uh, 220 of the Space Industry Regulations 2021, made under powers in Section 34.5 of the 2018 Act, whereby an operator licence must specify a limit on the amount of a licensee's liability for damage or injury to third parties. It also contrasts with Section 5.3 of the Outer Space Act 1986, which regulates UK nationals, Scottish firms and bodies incorporated under the law of any part of the UK who carry on space activities from outside the UK, which requires a licence to specify the maximum amount of the licensee's liability to indemnify the government under Section 10 of that Act. Through responses to the Government's consultation on spaceflight liability, insurance and charging, the Government is aware that operators holding unlimited liabilities could be a barrier to conducting spaceflight activities from the UK. The same consultation confirmed that other launching nations limit liabilities or provide a state guarantee for state fl spaceflight activities conducted from their territory. Current government policy and guidance is that all spaceflight operator licences will contain limits on the amount of the operator's liability and the amount of insurance they are required to hold so that no operator will face unlimited liability. However, industry operators continue to lobby for legislative certainty and have raised that for spaceflight activities in the UK to be commercially viable, there needs to be a clear mandatory cap on the amount of liability to indemnify under Section 36 of the 2018 Act. This bill will provide legislative certainty by amending May to Must in Section 12.2 of the 2018 Act so that an operator licence must specify a limit of the amount of the operator's liability under Section 36. The Bill also makes a small amendment to Section 36.3 of the 2018 Act. The proposed amendments to the 2018 Act will meet a key ask of the space sector in terms of regulatory improvements to provide assurance to investors that limits on the amount of an operator's liability 
will be included in licenses. It will also address a recommendation made by the Task Force on Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform. Now, there has been parliamentary scrutiny. The Science and Technology Committee raised the question of operator certainty on, li on liability caps in its second report of session 2022-23. The UK Space Strategy and UK Satellite Infrastructure, published on the 4th of November 2022. And as I say, the Task Force on Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform considered and viewed current requirements as discouraging investment and making the UK uncompetitive. The recommendation at 15.1 was to amend the Space Industry Act of 2018 to cap liability and indemnity requirements for licensed applicants to launch and operate satellites from the UK. There has also been consultation. On the 13th of October 2020, the Government published a consultation on space, spaceflight liability insurance and charging. Respondents raised concerns about the wording of Section 12.2 of the Space Industry Act 2018 that a licence only may contain a limit of liability with respect to claims made under Section 36 of the Act. And then on 5th of March 2021, the Government said in its response to consultation uh, in its space port and space flight activities, regulations and guidance, that if another suitable piece of primary legislation is brought forward, the Government may seek to amend the wording in Section 12.2 from May to must. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all benefit from the services that are provided by satellites. Whether you pay for your morning coffee using a contactless payment, Google Pay or even with cash withdrawn from an ATM, none of it would be possible without satellites. Satellites provide precise references for navigation, communications to remote places and pictures of our changing planet, not to mention the support they provide to the defence and security of the United Kingdom. Satellite data, space technology and space applications are used to enhance our everyday lives. The space sector is hugely valuable to the UK's economy. It is worth over £17.5 billion and directly employs more than 48,000 people. And it supports over 126,000 jobs across the supply chain. The UK is already one of the world's strongest centres of advanced satellite manufacturing. Thanks to this government, it is now possible to launch satellites from UK spaceports rather than relying solely on overseas spaceports to launch UK built satellites into orbit. Last year, the UK made an historical first launch from UK soil by Virgin Orbit at Spaceport Cornwall. In December, Saxavord spaceport in the Shetland Islands became the UK's first licensed vertical launch spaceport, with more spaceports to follow. New launch companies such as Orbex and Skyrora have built factories in Scotland, creating hundreds of new jobs ready to take advantage of the new opportunities that the government has created. 
Now, I've been in preparation uh, for this debate today. I have been asked uh, some questions by several members, and I will address those now. Uh, I've been asked what effect this bill will have on public expenditure, and I can assure the House that this bill will not entail any additional expenditure as the amendment is in line with, government, uh, with current government policy. I've been asked whether there are any transitional arrangements. There are not. Clause 2.3 provides that this bill will come into force at the end of the period of two months, beginning with the day on which it is passed. So transitional arrangements are not required because, by virtue of the government's policy on limiting liability, no, lic no licences have been granted without a limit on liability specified in them. I've been asked whether I've ensured co uh, compatibility with the European Convention on Human Rights. But as this bill is a private member's bill, no statement of com compatibility is required. However, as recorded in the explanatory notes, the Department for Transport considers that the provisions of this bill are compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. I've been asked whether it's compatible with environmental law. Again, as this bill is a private member's bill, no statement under Section 20 of the Environment Act 2021 is required. However, as recorded in the explanatory notes, the Department for Transport is of the view that the bill, as introduced into the House of Commons, does not contain provision which, if enacted, would be environmental law for the purposes of Section 20. And Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a narrowly focused bill addressing what the space sector has asked for. Um, so I'm hoping that no further amendments come forward, as it would be a shame to be unable to progress or deliver this key ask of our important, increasingly important space industry because of amendments or additions. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me give a final summary of the purpose of this bill, why I think it's important, and how it will benefit our space industry. Before a company can operate a satellite in orbit or carry out a launch mission from the UK, it must first obtain a spaceflight operator licence under the Space Industry Act 2018. The licence process ensures that spaceflight activities are undertaken safely, securely and in accordance with the UK's international obligations. Under United Nations space treaties, it is the state that is ultimately liable for any damage or injury that may be caused by their space activities, even where undertaken by commercial space operators. The Space Industry Act contains provisions to help mitigate potential costs to UK taxpayers arising from UK commercial spaceflight activities. This includes requirements for operators to hold insurance and, under Section 36 of the Act, to indemnify the UK Government and other named public bodies against any claims brought against the Government or body in respect of damage or loss. It is recognised, however, that placing unlimited liability on commercial space activities would be a barrier to operating in the United Kingdom. Other space nations, such as France and the United States of America, limit liabilities or provide a state guarantee for the launch activities that take place from their territory. The Space Industry Act 
contains powers to specify in a spaceflight operator's license a limit on the amount of an operator's liability to indemnify the government and other public bodies. Current government policy is that the regulator should use these, power, these powers to specify a limit on the amount of the operator's liability in the license so that no operator will face unlimited liability. This is essentially a form of risk sharing between the commercial operator and government. This policy is set out in guidance and I understand that all spaceflight operator licenses issued under the Space Industry Act to date contain a limit on the amount of an operator's liability. However, industry have made very clear in response to consultation and in other fora that they would welcome legal certainty as they will not face unlimited liability, uh, that they will not face unlimited liability when launching or operating a satellite from the UK. I believe that setting such a clear requirement in law would provide UK industry and those looking to invest in the UK greater certainty and carry more force than reliance on policy statements and guidance. This bill will provide that legal certainty by amending section 12.2 of the Space Industry Act so that spaceflight operator licenses must specify a limit on the amount of the operator's liability under 30, section 36 of the Act. So this bill will provide a vital further boost to our burgeoning UK space industry. And I am particularly mindful of the benefits that it will bring to growing and innovative companies such as Surrey, Surrey Satellite Technology Limited on the Surrey Research Park, many of whose past and current employees live in my Woking constituency. Mr Deputy Speaker, our UK space industry is thriving, but this measure is a vital necessity to secure an equally exciting and dynamic future. It is those companies like Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, just outside my constituency, many of whose employees live in my working constituency, who will benefit, and other firms, large, medium and small, will grow in the UK and come to the UK if this measure is passed. For that exciting and dynamic future, I commend this bill to the House. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mark Garnier. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I rise to speak in support of this bill, um, and I do so very much in my capacity as Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Space. Um, but, however, Mr Speaker, before I get into the, the, the thrust of my speech, um, perhaps I could draw the House's attention to my register of, of interest, both financial and non-financial, where I do have a number of outside roles that are relevant to the, to the UK space industry. Um, now, we've heard... So, first of all, can I congratulate the Honourable Member for, for Woking for bringing what appears to be an extraordinarily simple bill, but actually is, as we've heard from his very, very well thought through and well delivered speech, has very, very profound impacts on a lot of technical areas within the space sector. And I think it shows a great deal of skill on his part that he can do something quite so complex in quite such a straightforward and, and, and intelligent and elegant way. Um, as I say, we've already heard from the member for, for Woking that this is a bill that seeks to enhance the UK's position in the space industry. It does so through changes to liability for sp spaceflight risks, and this is a wholly pragmatic and welcome change. The purpose of this bill is to make the UK an even better place to operate spa space businesses from, and this follows from the space strategy pu uh, published two or three years ago. 
as we've heard. It recognises some technical anomalies within the insurance sector and seeks to resolve them in a very sensible and very good way. Importantly, it clarifies aspects of risk that should provide comfort for those financial wizards supporting our superb space innovators, many of whom I have met and many of whom, I'm delighted to say, have come to Parliament on one of the Space All Party Group's now regular space sector showcases. And if I may use this opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, the next one uh, will be in the Atlee Suite on the morning of the 19th of March, and this event looks to, uh, seeks to look at the sustainability and future of space activities. And all members and all members' staff are indeed welcome to come along and see this absolutely fascinating area. But we've heard that the, the, the space sector um, is incredibly important. People don't realise that every time they go to a cash point machine, that their, their, their transaction is being um, uh, confirmed through position navigation and timing that comes from um, uh, sat uh, navigation satellites passing overhead. We have an amazing number of things that we can do. We can look at, we can look, uh, we can analyse economic activity in a country through heat sensors from Earth, Earth observation satellites that can tell us if a city is being busy or a port is being busy or railway stations are being busy. We can look at, at any number of different things. We can predict the use of, uh, of crops, um, uh, fertiliser and, and planting and distress crops through Earth observation satellites. There's a whole host of different things we can do. And Mr Speaker, I'm delighted to say that I chair the advisory board, this is a non-financial interest, of the Space Energy Initiative, where we're looking very, very specifically to see how using space and to beam energy from space can be a, uh, a future of a secure and safe planet, which is absolutely extraordinary what we can do. It was 1969 that we first landed man on the moon, and we're doing an enormous number of brilliant things. And I'm delighted to say that there are a number of UK industries, uh, space industries, that are now looking at getting involved in the Artemis programme, where, we, uh, where NASA are hoping to take um, astronauts back to the moon, possibly as early as next year. But it is a very, very exciting time for space in a whole, whole wide range of, range of areas. Um, but, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would suggest that one of the things we can possibly get wrong is that we focus specifically on the space sector itself. And what I would want to do is to suggest that there is an increased benefit to the UK further than just the space industry. Now, the space industry is important for a number of different reasons, one of which is that because of the, of the high value of, of this type of activity, actually it, it, um, it addresses exactly what Adam Smith proposed in his um, uh, 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, where you try to create greater wealth by having greater productivity. We've had a productivity conundrum in this country for a number of years, but actually concentrating on the space sector could allow us to, to try and increase the productivity and therefore benefit the whole of this country. But I think it's worth talking about perhaps the service sector, um, which is where actually this bill looks at in the insurance industry. So members will be aware that before coming to Parliament, I was in financial services, both in investment banking and small investment fund management. So when I look at the opportunities presented like something like the space sector, I tend to look at the many UK opportunities, not just in the context of the direct beneficiary, but how it helps the wider economy. So the UK has one of the best, and certainly the oldest, wholesale insurance markets right here in the City of London. So it must be the aim of the whole of government to not just ensure spate flights and operations are controlled from the UK, but that all involved in the space industry come to London to seek insurance and other financial services from all of our financial service experts. So I've now argued for some time that, there should, that the UK should do more to align the interests of our space industry with the interests of the UK financial markets. And I take inspiration um, from this, from a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Back when he was newly appointed Chancellor after the 1997 general election many, many years ago, the Honourable Member for Cacaldi and Calvin Beath recognised the UK's good but small film industry. He chose to make actually quite a small intervention into the tax system to incentivise investment into UK films. And as a direct result of this, he helped rebuild the UK film industry into what it is today, which is a very vibrant and a very innovative industry. So I suspect, when we look at some great films, that a direct thread can be traced between that intervention by the member for Cacaldi and Colden Beath back in the late 1990s and the success of the Harry Potter franchise right here in the UK. Now, Harry Potter is a brilliant export, and it was always going to be a great film success. But I would be absolutely certain that without that intervention, the heroes of Harry Potter may well have cast their spells with an American accent. And I think we can turn round to that 
dare I say it, great former Labour Chancellor, uh, that he has done a huge amount for, um, uh, for, for the British film industry. It may be the only time, though, that you'll hear me say great and Labour Chancellor in the same sentence, but he did a very, very important job, and I think we should recognise that. Um, of course, there has been a little bit of abuse of the system by, by one or two um, people enjoying it, but, but not, notwithstanding that, it's been really important. So, so to you, Mr Speaker, I believe, can an intervention be made to not just support the space industry, but to support our world-class wholesale financial markets. And it's important. The, 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 the UK should, uh, the City of London, should not just be thinking about what it does today and does it do markets well. What it should be doing is completely innovating the whole time in order to seek opportunities that come into the future. So we should not just think about any industry in terms of what we can offer it. We must think about our ambitions in any sector with a view to how it can enhance wider service sectors. And in the case of financial services, investment bankers raising capital and investment, uh, insurance services securing risk cover for innovators, or helping investors find a way to maximise their opportunities in this sector, we should be thinking how a fiscal intervention might benefit all concerned. And after all, Mr Speaker, our brilliant innovators, our research institutions, our network of capital, uh, sorry, catapult accelerators, our universes and all the rest of it, already attract a great deal of international business to UK, and that is a very, very good thing. But we also need to appreciate that we need the best space industry finances in the world to come to the UK and locate their expertise right here in the City of London, and the basic, best insurance experts and the best space lawyers. We need to seek to achieve in every one of uh, in the space industry and the wider economy to seeing that the UK is the best place to come for everything needed to support their space ambitions. So I welcome the government. I believe the government is enthusiastic about this private members' bill. And again, I thank the honourable member for working for, for bringing it forward. As I say, it's a really truly innovative bill. Um, the City of London, as I think I've mentioned, needs to remain relevant. Um, the City of London is an incredible jewel in the crown of this country. It's had its problems, but nonetheless, it pays through taxation for an awful lot of hospitals, an awful lot of police officers, an awful lot of schools. There's a lot of good things that come out of the City of London, but it needs to be relevant the whole time for the future. And what we need to be doing is to making sure that as we develop something like the space industry or AI or any other of these industries, that we help the City of London focus and be able to be a part of that in order to have a symbiotic relationship between the financial services sector and the sector that is going to benefit our economy. So I'm delighted to support this bill. Um, it is a fantastic bill. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sharon McCrory. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I uh, congratulate my honourable friend from Woking for bringing this private member's bill today, and I rise in support of uh, the bill uh, today. And um, following my honourable friend uh, from uh, previous uh, contribution, we're almost in danger of having some joined-up thinking in this place today, because I'm going to take us from the, from the uh, City of London, which, where he's made some absolutely brilliant and valid points, to the sector. And uh, one would not be uh, surprised to see a Cornish MP on the benches when we're, on, when we're about to speak about space. We have a lot to say in Cornwall about the space sector. Cornwall is, in fact, at the forefront of the UK's developing space economy and is playing an increasingly important role in the national space programme to ensure as many people as possible contribute to and benefit from the economic growth. Cornwall's data, space and aerospace strategy ambitions include mitigating and reversing environmental degradation, restoring nature and seeking to protect businesses and communities from the impact of climate change, both locally and globally, working with the national government to grow the UK space economy as a whole and growing the Cornwall and Arsenal Scilly economy to deliver jobs and international investment uh, whilst offering an outstanding quality of space, uh, quality of life for its people. Now, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly uh, LEP, Local Enterprise Partnership, made space one of its main priorities some time ago. And if the House would just indulge me, I'd like to pay tribute to one of the uh, key players in this space, uh, one Mark Dudridge, who we lost suddenly uh, last year. And it was Mark's words that he used to be the chair of the uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. And sadly, I was on a meeting with him here in this place on Zoom, and a matter of hours later, I'm afraid Mark sadly, very tragically and suddenly died. But Mark was a, uh, le has left a hole in the, uh, in the industry and in, in, in the business community in Cornwall, and he is very fondly remembered. As a new MP, uh, you look for the people that you can trust, 
and, and that have knowledge in all of these things so that you can gain your own knowledge and you can learn about these things. And Mark was certainly one of those people to me. Of the space industry, he said, we've backed Cornwall's space, space board bid from day one because we saw the potential for Cornwall to play a vital role in the UK's space economy ambitions and to create high-value jobs. The global space industry could triple in value to more than $1 trillion by 2040, and that's what's driving uh, that climate change and security and telecoms is, is driving this change. The facilities that we're helping to fund at Spaceport Cornwall are already having a catalytic, catalytic effect and are attracting new space companies into Cornwall. One of those international space logistics company, Deorbit, which will establish a space uh, satellite assembly, integration and testing facility at Spaceport Cornwall Centre, uh, will, will, will be there with support from the European Space Agency. Now, Mark has played a key role in this, and others are continuing his work. And he was a talented and passionate advocate for Cornwall and has left a large hole in there. But I just want to, if I can, thank my honourable friend for bringing this clarity to the industry as a whole. As he's mentioned already, where we have a may, we now have a must, and this is always important for industry so that they know what they're, what they're doing. In Cornwall, if you didn't already know, we have over 150 businesses that are to do with the space uh, industry. We have 35 local and national partners. In 2023, we had 1,300 people in Cornwall employed in the space industry. The industry was worth about £88 million. And in, and, uh, in 2030, we expect to have more than 3,000 people employed with a potential value of a, of a billion pounds. My honourable friends have mentioned some of, uh, of the businesses that are, are already and, and, and the services that are already employed by the space industry. Um, I'd like to add things like the marine protection uh, areas that we're, we're deploying, not just around the UK waters, but globally. It's satellites that do that for us. How do we know how bad climate change is in different parts of the, of the, of the world? Well, it's satellites that do this for us. And it was an interesting debate that we would have in Cornwall Council when I was a councillor about, uh, um, about the benefits of the spaceport in Cornwall. Some of our environmentalists were very concerned that there were, you know, we were sending huge, great jumbo jets off into space, and you know, this was going to cause a lot of pollution. But actually, our, my belief is that, uh, and the belief of a lot of my constituents was that actually the, the good outweighs the bad in this. You know, the amount of information we can now get, surely in Cornwall, we want to be providing the jobs and the infrastructure to allow this information to come back to Earth. So what else are we actually doing in Cornwall in the space industry? Artificial intelligence, professional services. We've got space lawyers in Cornwall. So this will be of great interest to them today. They will be able to help their clients. They are, they are abreast of all of this. The Foot Anstey is, the, is one such firm who provides these services. Um, we recently had um, drone uh, tests over the Bay of Falmouth for, uh, by, by a company called Open Skies. And I'd like to pay tribute to the Far Falmouth Harbour Commissioner for really spearheading this project, Miles Carden. And basically what it can do is when we have huge tankers that are um, ashore in, in the Bay of Falmouth, they can take out medical supplies, they can take out bits for the boats. You know, if in high seas, when the pilot is even too dangerous for pilot boats, it means that uh, they, can, they can take supplies straight out to the boats. It can save lives even. It can save, certainly save uh, a lot of money for those companies. It's a great investment. Now, another company uh, was, is a, company, a tech company called Farfields. And they, at Mylo Boat Harbour, uh, with Mylo Boat Hire, uh, have electric eco launches. launches. They are uh, testing that in Cornwall, using a low-cost satellite network rather than wireless systems. To, to ensure that, they, uh, they, that we can make GPS checks on battery voltage of a boat's electric motor. They can check bilge pumps, they can check all sorts of things on boats, and all of this is happening. So it's not always launching great big rockets into space. This is all happening as part of the space industry, and it's vitally important. So the ones that people will know about, my honourable friend mentioned it earlier, earlier the Nuki spaceport, that was 10 years of work, and again, I'd like to pay tribute to Melissa Quinn, who, who spearheaded a huge amount of that project. Uh, the, and despite what people said in the press, actually, the Nuki spaceport was a huge success. Everything that Nuki did and everything that Cornwall did worked perfectly. Cosmic Girl ran into issues. The mission, and sadly, was unsuccessful on their part. But Nuki proved that we could have a spaceport in the UK, and that's what mattered to Cornwall, of course.
to just reinforce that point, and actually it's, it's rather a peculiar thing about the British where we, where we tend to look at the failure as a problem. There was a, an example of, of exactly this type of thing that happened with SpaceX with its uh, Starship launch, and it took off. And the minute it not cleared the pad, the mission had been entirely successful. The, the, the SpaceX team, when this enormous rocket, bigger than a Saturn V rocket, went spiralling out of control and blew up, there was a cheer because they'd got it right. We sometimes get it wrong in the UK. The, as my honourable friend mentions, there's a problem with the, with the rocket itself. But in every single way, the UK got it absolutely bang on the money. It was the government, it was the licensing, it was everything went absolutely perfectly right. The fact that it was a second stage fuel filter that went wrong is nothing to do with Nukin, it's nothing to do with the government. It's a real success story. Thank you, my honourable friend, for that intervention, and I will pass his good regards back to, to the good people of Cornwall. And he's absolutely right. That was a, it, was a, it was a brilliant project from start to finish. The engagement we had locally, the engagement we had nationally, uh, the local MP, uh, my honourable friend, uh, member for Sinostal and Newquay, you know, was with this project from start to finish. Um, and if I could just say what it meant to the people of Cornwall, it has actually inspired a whole generation of children in Cornwall. I actually feel sorry for, for, for colleagues who are trying to go into schools now and talk about mining and you know, renewables and trying to inspire children to do, go into these careers because Melissa Quinn went in and she just absolutely wiped the floor with them because she's inspired a whole generation about space careers. And there's a lot of, lot of kids in Cornwall, a lot of families in Cornwall think, oh, you know, because we live in Cornwall, you know, this isn't for us. It absolutely is for us. It absolutely is for our children. And because of that project, uh, we, you know, we've seen investment going to Truro and Penwith College, for example, the facilities they have there now to train up uh, engineers, you know, virtual welding, uh, all sorts of things. I have no idea what they do there, but the facilities are very shiny and very fabulous. And uh, Martin Tucker, who is the principal there, again, has been fully engaged with this this and other projects uh, to ensure that those kids that were in primary school at the beginning of this project and got that inspiration can then take their training right there in Cornwall and then go into careers still in Cornwall. This is what Cornish MPs have been fighting for for a decade or more and it's starting to happen now and it's absolutely thanks to that project. And, you know, Cosmic Girl ran into problems. Nuki was only ever supposed to have one or two launches a year. Are we going to get another one? Yes, I absolutely hope we are going to get another one. But it's not just about, you know, working for these launches. It means that we can uh, support now. We've got the, the know-how and, the, and, and the, uh, the supply chains and the knowledge to support other launches around the country and, and around the world. And, uh, you know... We, this, you know, it's just absolutely fantastic that that, that that is still there and that we keep it going. And I know that the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly LEP and uh, Cornwall Council is still very um, enthusiastic to ensure that we harness that, we don't let any of that expertise go. Uh, and then the other large company that people may or may not have heard of, uh, I'm sure my honourable friend will have heard of, is Goon Hilly Listening Station. Uh, when you drive right down into the west of Cornwall, into my uh, honourable friend, the member of St Ives uh, area, uh, you look across the, uh, the moorland and you see these huge satellite dishes and you think, my goodness, what on earth were they doing there? Uh, but this Goon Hilly is, is, again, fantastic. The world's first private deep space communities ne uh, c communications network. Uh, it provides uh, additional ca capacity to NASA and to the uh, European Space Eng um, Agency networks. Um, any deep space mission that you'll have heard of uh, will have been supported by Goonhilly and the team there. Um, and I don't know if anybody ever saw the, um, the, the Australian movie, The Dish, uh, where you know they're kind of they're going to have that small amount of time where they are the only ones on Earth supporting whatever deep space mission it is, like moon landing mission it is. It started a bit like that, but it has developed so much more. And the capacity—I can't remember the figures off the top of my head—but the capacity for the amount of data that they can now store at that facility is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, Ian Jones, who runs the facilities, is is always looking for people to go and, and see how brilliantly they're doing there. Um, you know, radio, astro uh, radio astronomy supported by our cryogenically cooled antenna, a 30 metre ten uh, antenna. Uh, it's part of uh, the whole, the whole uh, global uh, space communications uh, network. So ambitions that we have, um, 
Well, you know, by 2030, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, they hope, we hope, will be a national uh, leader in the National Space Programme, exploiting the physical, digital and intellectual assets in the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly area, using satellite data to overcome local and global changes, such as the impact of climate change we've heard before. And by 2030, data space and aerospace in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly will have con contributed to an additional £1 billion to the economic value for the Cornwalls and the Isles of Scilly through increased product productivity, jobs turnover, and creating twice the average GVA per capita uh, of £45,000 uh, or, or more. I mean, to, so, but to facilitate these strategic ambitions, we've identified local and national strategic leads to support us in maintaining the awareness of the priorities. I think this is absolutely vital in uh, uh, following the uh, the aftermath of, of, of what happened at Newquay, and as I say, it is still very much part of Cornwall's and the Isles of Scilly uh, local enterprise partnership priorities. Um, it is interlinked with all of the other industries that we're trying to promote in Cornwall, such as renewables and, and the resurgence of critical minerals. You know, we need the critical minerals that are going to come out of the ground in Cornwall to, to ensure that we have all of these satellites, uh, but also to ensure those 150 companies that I mentioned earlier who are doing all sorts of amazing different things Partly, you know, you can build now a satellite that's only the size of a Ford Fiesta and that will go up into space. You know, the, we, we had a, a satellite that we were going to, uh, that we were going to launch uh, and hopefully this is still a reality where it um, takes a deep dive look at, from space, uh, of Cornwall's uh, landscape and, you know, what, what we're actually doing, what we're not doing. For example, you know, we have a, a slightly different graded agricultural land in Cornwall, so grade 3B, which is, you know, vulnerable to solar farms. But actually in Cornwall, it's the most fertile land we've got. We're learning all of this stuff because of satellites. So, I, you know, I could go on and on. Um, but it's just to let everybody know that this change that my honourable friend has introduced today although it looks like a small change, is absolutely a huge change. Not only does it bring uh, clarity to all of the companies that my other honourable friend was talking about in the City of London, but also to every single company that I've mentioned today and more to ensure that uh, everybody is a level playing field for everybody, um, it, everything is clear and they can, uh, they can go on and hopefully continue to build and build and build because this is a very exciting future for our country. It's a very exciting future for Cornwall and I thank my honourable friend for bringing it. Oxen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady from Turin Falmouth. Um, you will find um, few less intrepid voyages in this particular enterprise uh, defined in the face of adversity but also on a voyage of discovery. I think she's made an absolutely excellent speech there and she's picked up on what this is really about. I think they did there. Um, the the Honourable Lady quite rightly identified this is not just about putting big shiny things on rockets and firing them into the sky. This is about unlocking those other important bits of the economy and in fact the Honourable Gentleman from Wild Forest also made this point incredibly eloquently. Uh, you can go back to Adam Smith and actually sort of see the, the, the cosmic threads of this if you will. Um, we are opening up new sectors for the UK economy, we are empowering our people. I, I'm delighted with the idea of space lawyers. I, I promise not to go around waving my LLB about, but that sounds awfully like the superhero name I'd end up giving myself anyway. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. I have to say, actually, I am a member of the Science and Tech Select Committee as well, so I was very, I was very pleased to hear the Honourable Gentleman from Woking mention our report. Um, a lot of love went into that. We enjoyed ourselves a bit too much. I'm, I'm not going to deny it. Um, I find this entire sector incredibly fascinating and extremely exciting, and not just because of, of this, the aforementioned geekery, but it's, it's the potential. And I think about kids in my constituency who are basically being exposed now to opportunities and new horizons that simply weren't on their radar even five or six years ago. I'm now talking to apprentices in my patch, and they are they're talking about actually perhaps working in this area. I mean, some of them have gone to uh, work for Airbus, who are doing absolutely fantastic, uh, fantastic things with satellites. Um, I recently went to their Stevenage factory as part of my IPT fellowship, which is in space and aerospace. Um, and some of the stuff they are purporting to do, so for example, transferring energy from space, which is genuinely going to be a game changer. And I, I was absolutely flabbergasted when they explained it to me. But things like monitoring climate change, there will be satellites that are literally going to be able to tell you how much heat is transferring out of wood in forests so we know actually whether or not rainforests need to be reforested uh, whether you know wh whether we're actually going to be facing climate change of 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees 
this is mind-bendingly brilliant stuff and it is now available to kids who might have been sort of five, six years ago told, right, well, once you finish that, you either go and work at, you know, sort of the, the JJB Sports factory down the road or, you know, you just have to go work in a shop. It's... It's really, really exciting. It's fantastically valuable. And it's also hugely important for things like our, finan uh, our financial sector, which, you know, Greater Manchester has a fairly sizable financial sector. It's great for us. We also have a very large legal sector. I know I used to work in it. Um, I, I would love to be a space lawyer. Let's see how the rest of the year goes. I might need to become one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, this is this is about empowering us, and I have to say, actually, really, I, I, the other thing I really love about this bill, and I, I, again, I promise not to wave my LLB at that too much, it's the simplicity of it, it's the elegance, it is the fact that this is, this is that sort of that Coltrane sax solo. It's it's so simple, it's brilliant because it is changing a word that effectively empowers us to do so much more, and and the power of this is really, really. It's, it's inestimable. This is why it was part of the report that the Science and Tech Select Committee put out there, because what we're doing at the moment is disincentivising people to innovate. And that is not what we should be about at all. What we are saying is actually go out there, take some risks, and we will make sure that actually they, they can be rewarded. You are not going to be completely and utterly obliterated for having a go. And, you know, and if the second stage fuel pump doesn't work, it's not the end of your business. Um, and we really, really need to be alive to that because we need risk takers, as we do in every sector. We need people who are willing to sort of boldly go into the final <laughs> frontier. Um, I I, I've not finished yet. Uh, <laughs> when, when, I was say, when, I, when I shout house, you know, I've done them all. Um, <clears throat> but look, fundamentally, this is, this is about making sure actually Britain's future is is not just here on Earth, but in the stars. And we have every right to be there as much as any other country. I'm delighted that there are launches. I most certainly will do. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for intervening, especially because I've just rambled on for a, a, I don't know how long. But uh, one thing I didn't mention, which he might be interested in, is the defence sector. Again, when I visited Goonhilly, there's a huge amount going on there. I mean, you know, we, all, we talk about our, our maritime fleet being bothered by the Russians and the Chinese uh, on a daily basis, but actually our satellites and our space are as well. It's hugely important that we're at the forefront of that. Does he agree with me on that point? Entirely correct, and like me, she's uh, she's been on the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. Um, I, I was restraining myself from mentioning Cold Rose when she was talking earlier yeah, during her yeah, excellent yeah. speech, but of course I've now done it. So, um, yeah, the, the, our defence sector is incredibly important as well. And again, BAE Systems, Airbus, th we are making this stuff here. These are you know defence manufacturers in this country creating jobs and opportunities. It's hugely important, and I am absolutely uh, delighted to be supporting this. And again. I love the technical merits of it. The Honourable Gentleman has, has done an absolute blinder doing something quite sensible. And I'll, I will give you a lived example, because quite frankly, the Empire would not have been able to build the second Death Star if they'd been on the hook for the price of the first one. <laughs> the Honourable Gentleman has stuck the landing on this one. Congratulations. I will look forward to supporting this. Mr Kane. Oh. <laughs> oh, right. So, well, it's a... Uh, it's, it's an honour to follow Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I mean the member for Hayward and Middleton. That was pun central. I may have a few of my own in this uh, uh, speech today. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, for calling me. And uh, can I congratulate the member for Woking for bringing his bill so far this far. Uh, it's been brought before us for second reading. The aim of the bill is to help support our space sector. As he eloquently said, I was born in 1969. As it happens, the same year we took one small step for man, which was in a great leap for mankind. As the member for Wire Forest said, it feels with recent technological advances we could be on the threshold of another such leap. And we woke up to the news today that Odysseus had landed on the lunar planes on the face of the moon, the first private mission by the Americans since 1972. Uh, uh, and we have always, as a species, looked to the stars and we hope one day to dwell among them. And I felt the enthusiasm in this house for uh, that mission uh, here today. Uh, and the honorable member for Wire Forest also mentioned uh, Artemis uh, mission, which will be the first uh, staffed uh, space mission, hopefully, uh, that will orbit the moon, um, hopefully next year. 
uh, indeed, and Artemis was the goddess of the wilderness, uh, so aptly named as we begin our new era of exploration of the stars. Now, the bill amends the 2018 Space Industry Act, which an act written with the purpose of regulating space activities, suborbital orbital activities and associated activities carried out in the United Kingdom. The space industry and their trade body, UK Space, welcome this bill as we do. The Space Industry Act of 2018 enabled spaceflight activities from the UK, such as operating a satellite in orbit and enabling launch to orbit from UK spaceports for the first time. Companies who conduct spaceflight activities from the UK must hold insurance and indemnity government against possible third-party claims for damages. Currently, the Space Industry Act says that there is no limit to the amount of compensation that must be paid if anything goes wrong with satellites in space that are UK owned. Industry believes that addressing this will prevent satellite operators registering satellites in other countries to get a better liability deal. Space is becoming more congested. It is right that we amend bills as the industry develops. We are now at a key point in developing a thriving and dynamic space industry, an industry that we now know is worth £17.5 billion to the UK and employing has been said up to about 50,000 people. I was speaking recently also, as the member for Hayward and Middleton uh, said, to Airbus, who I'm sure you're aware are the second biggest global space company and the largest in the UK. They were telling me that they operate over seven key sites in the United Kingdom, principally Stevenage and Portsmouth. For Stevenage and to Saturn, um, sort of Stevenage to Saturn, it's been quite the ring to it. Uh, I'm following on a puns from the member for Hayward and Middleton, uh, if you pardon uh, me. And why not? He does mention why can't this be in every sector, in every constituency, and even the new Atom Valley that we are developing in Greater Manchester uh, to the north of the conurbation. But it's before we get onto the supply chain, which is fast. There are almost 2,900 space suppliers, half of which are small and medium uh, enterprises. So vital that we support this industry. It is so vital that we support this industry here in the UK. I happen to know that in my own constituency of Withenshaw and Sale East, in 2022, a million pounds was spent with space suppliers. It's good to see procurement in the, to the sector, which benefits the bottom 10% of the most deprived areas of the land. There are so many good reasons to support this sector. We want to remove barriers to new businesses setting up here in the UK. We want companies to be incentivised to set up in the UK rather than taking their business elsewhere, whereupon they are likely to use suppliers geographically local to themselves. We do not want to lose out on these jobs. We want these jobs of the future to be here in the UK. Interestingly, one of the other main sites that is strong in the space sector is in Newport and as we heard from the member uh, from Truro and Falmouth recently jobs have been at risk in that area uh, because of the um, Tata steel uh, plants so unite the union and my own union community tell me that well-paid highly skilled unionized steel jobs are at risk in the area we must ensure that these areas are not de-industrialized and that there are opportunities available for those areas for our workers and for our young people as well. We also want our own SMEs to be part of the supply chain. Encouraging uh, businesses is what we should all be about. Now, this bill will ensure that if anything were to go wrong, and by that I mean anything from launch failure to satellite crashes. However, this is not just about UK launches. It's about UK ownership as governments has the final liability on any space item that is owned by the UK or government. So can I congratulate the Honourable Member for bringing this here today? Can I um, thank the Honourable Member for Wire Forest for his work for the APPG for space. Uh, he quoted The Wealth of Nations, a much favoured novel book, theory, <laughs> uh, by, by, the, 
by the members by the members opposite can i remind him about the treaties of the invisible hand that um uh, economic uh, activity should enrich the whole community and we know that space can uh, do uh, this uh, can i congratulate for the speech uh, for the member for um Truru and uh, Falmouth. Uh, I, I was really intrigued, really, about as a nation, you know, we sometimes have left behind areas. I'm trying not to make a p particular party political point, but our coastal areas, our market towns, suburbs, and through agglomeration in maritime, in aviation, and in space we can really begin to think about how we regenerate these areas by giving people opportunities. Like we created a legal sector, sector when I was a young councillor in Manchester in the 90s and a banking sector and a media sector that people don't have to leave their communities when they turn 18 or 22 when they get their degrees, that those jobs, those future technological jobs will be in the areas that they grow up in. And I think that's probably one of the greatest hopes that we can give as politicians to our young people, but this is what the space pro, um, sector provides across the country through the supply chain, but particularly in the southwest and particularly in Shetland Islands, such a diverse uh, geographical spread. But I think uh, the point you made uh, is um, really important. To the member for Hayward and Middleton, thanks for all the puns. Good luck with your career as a space lawyer after you, well, whatever happens at the general election. Uh, and. Um, I, 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 I wish him well. And to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, the industry tells us that this piece of legislation will provide the confidence for them uh, and will encourage investment in the UK, providing highly paid, highly skilled and, yes, unionised jobs up and down the nation. And on that basis, we support the bill. Thank you. Just how privileged I am, before I call the Minister, to be chairing this particular debate, as I did once have astronaut Nicole Stott and the crew of Discovery uh, up in the public gallery took them over to number 10 Downing Street and I've also been honoured and privileged to have met the last man to walk on the moon twice Eugene Tiernan once here and once at Cape Canaveral and I've seen a few launches so um, space is very important to me Minister Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I agree it has been probably the most enjoyable debate I've ever taken part of in, uh, uh, in Parliament and indeed particularly after uh, last Wednesday night's activities it's nice to have a uh, debate which is uh, cross party in its uh, support and uh, enthusiasm. So, <laughs> you've got to spoil it, you've got to spoil it all Mr Speaker. We have, a, few, a few months ago I went to see the exhibition The Moonwalkers. Uh, um, uh, with, the, uh, by, with narr narr narration by Tom Hanks and about the 12 men and they are all men who have walked on the moon and it's an extraordinary exhibition I highly recommend it to uh, everyone in particular Deputy Speaker if you are interested in space it's about an age of adventure an extraordinary era 50 years ago when we were walking on a, uh, another celestial body and we thought it was the dawn of a whole new era and this was just the start and would carry on uh, mankind and womankind would carry on exploring the rest of the universe but it didn't happen and no one has been back to the moon uh, since until yesterday not a person but the united states returned to the moon for the first time as the uh, shadow minister said for 50 years we had a uh, the Odysseus robot uh, landed uh, near the South Pole on the moon. But the real significance of it isn't that it was, it's 50 years for the United States to come back, but the fact that it was a commercial company, Intuitive Machines, a Houston-based uh, uh, company, that sent a uh, robot to the moon. Because we are, the space age is at the beginning of a completely new era, where it isn't about... Uh, uh, states, governments of big countries trying to prove how powerful and effective they are for national pride, but actually real commercial opportunity. And there are many of my honourable friends of uh and I'll come to some of the things I've said, have mentioned all the commercial opportunities that are out there, but people are doing it not for reasons of national pride, but actually because it's really useful uh, for humankind, for uh, uh, communications and uh, sensing and geographic information and all the, all the things that have been mentioned. But this is now a properly based commercial uh, opportunity uh, for the UK. And that's why I really want to thank my honourable friend, the member for Woking, uh, for bringing this short but in fact uh, impactful and very timely bill uh, before the House. And I've uh, very much enjoyed the contributions from all the other members who have spoken today. And I'm pleased to confirm that he does indeed have the full support of the Government. 
and I will briefly outline why the government are fully supportive uh, of this bill. Now, as my honourable friend has said, and others have said, the UK does have a thriving uh, space sector. In fact, I learned today that Cornwall has got 150 space companies, which is something I didn't know uh, until this morning. Um, in fact, we have a far more thriving space sector than most people uh, realise. So, did you, did you know, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the satellite capital of Europe is in fact Glasgow, uh, and that more, indeed more small satellites are built in Glasgow alone than anywhere outside California? And the UK is now the second most attractive destination for commercial space investment after the United States. We get more space investment in the UK than any other country in the world apart from the United States. Now, also, Mr. Deputy Speaker, given your interest in space, did you realise that no rocket has ever been launched into orbit from European soil? We do have a European Space Agency. It has launched rockets into space, but it does so largely from French Guyana in, uh, in South America. And you can launch rockets, or rockets have been launched into space from Kazakhstan. But never from European soil has this uh, been done before. But we now have a spaceport uh, in the Shetlands uh, preparing to do just that. Saxe Vord, which many uh, of uh, my uh, honourable friends have mentioned, and indeed we might end up with one from uh, Cornwall as well. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the Shetland one might be. Uh, might end up being the first. Uh, and that will be uh, a truly historic moment. There are rockets launched into space from Europe, I'll just make this clarification, but they're suborbital. So from uh, Norway and Sweden, they go, they go around the Earth once or maybe twice, but they then come back down to Earth. Never has a rocket been launched into sustained orbit from uh, European soil. And, so this and if the UK, as we plan, to be the first European nation to do that, again, marks a huge uh, opportunity. That's why we've set up the whole regulatory regime, the licensing regime, lic licensing these spaceports, because there are not just in the UK but other European countries, there are companies making satellites, making rockets that want to launch into space, and it would be far easier and cheaper for them to do it from European soil than from, to have to transport the rockets to America or to French Guyana or indeed to, uh, uh, to Kazakhstan. I'll very have to give way for you. It's more of a technical point, if you wouldn't mind, but I know that we've done an awful lot in a very short space of time to get our regulatory system up to scratch. How do we compare to the other European nations or Europe as a whole on that? Thank you. I, I thank my honourable friend for that. But this has actually been a, a, um, a Brexit opportunity, dare I say, because actually, we, uh, the, uh, having left the EU, we're allowed to we enabled us to set up a whole new regulation regime for it and go through it in great detail. Other countries do have, uh, indeed, European countries do have uh, regimes for uh, allowing. Uh, uh, space uh, activity, but none of them are in the same detail as the UK, none of them with the launch opportunities of the UK. And in fact, we're, we're blessed in the UK with our, our geography for various reasons. If you're going to launch a, a rocket in space, you also need to launch it from somewhere where there aren't a lot of people, uh, but also you want to launch it over a trajectory where, if the rocket uh, uh, um, has a splashdown, etc., that actually it's not going to land on, uh, on any other people. And that's why, I mean, Cornwall is, is obviously very interesting, but also the north of uh, Shetland. So actually if you launch into space, uh, into orbit from there, you, need to, you want to go north, you actually get, end up going through the Bering Strait. The first land you uh, would hit would be uh, New Zealand, but hopefully you'll be up in, uh, uh, up in orbit by that time. Uh, not many other European countries have got the geographic opportunities that we have. I mean, it would be very difficult for Switzerland, say, or Germany to, to, uh, to do that, but we are blessed with our geography. And I should say that one, one of the differences, and again, why it's an opportunity for the UK now, that if, the, uh, if you go back uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to, uh, uh, a couple of decades, the main focus was on big rockets launching satellites into geostationary uh, orbit, which is uh, 47,000 uh, miles out, where they stay above the same point of land as the Earth uh, rotates. You need a very big rocket to get it uh, up there and get it into place. And the, it's far easier to do that if you launch close to the equator. So that's why the uh, and you launch it in the direction of the equator. And that's why the European Space Agency has its uh, launch site at French Guyana because it's close uh, to the equator. But what is happening now is we are not doing geostationary uh, satellites that far out to space, but actually the, all the interest is in low Earth orbit satellites. So all the uh, satellites launched by SpaceX, for example, for its uh, internet service, are all low orbit satellites. Uh, and actually, it's easier to do that uh, over, over the North Pole. And that's why th this, this changing uh, technical nature of uh, the usage of set space and satellites m gives a huge opportunity for the UK. And the satellites themselves are getting a lot smaller. I mean, the satellites in the, again, if you go back 20 or 30 years ago, the satellites were the size of buses, whereas now they can be the size of fridges or indeed microwaves. Uh, and as a result, you need far f smaller rockets uh, to launch them into, uh, into space. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed all that uh, uh, explanation, Mr. Speaker. Um, so the UK, as we've heard from my friend, uh, from various honourable members, and indeed the shadow minister, the UK space industry supports an industrial base of over uh, 1,500 space companies in total, and it provides high-skill, high-quality uh, jobs all across the UK, with over 77% of employees holding at least a primary. Uh, degree, and we've heard uh, from uh, uh, the, all the jobs for Cornwall, and indeed mentioned for Manchester. But it really is a true levelling up agenda. I mentioned uh, uh, the space jobs in Glasgow and uh, Saxe Ward in the Shetlands, but our um, we have. Uh, uh, Orbex, that was mentioned, is also another Scottish company. In 2018, opened a new facility in Forest, incorporating uh, design and manufacturing facility for their Prime launch vehicle. Uh, and so far, the Prime project has created more than 140 highly skilled jobs uh, in the local area, with many more anticipated as the company continues to grow. The Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, anticipate the Sutherland Spaceport, another not one of our spaceports will support around 613 full-time equivalent posts through the wider Highlands and Islands, including an estimated 44 full-time equivalent posts on the site itself. Saxe of Ward, as we mentioned earlier, anticipate that by this year, by the end of this year, the spaceport site could, have a, could support a total of 605 jobs in Scotland, including 140 locally and 210 across the wider Shetland region. And Spaceport Cornwall, as we uh, heard earlier, anticipate the project will deliver 150 direct jobs and 240 indirect jobs by 2030. I will very, very happy to give way to the Honourable Member. I thank the Minister for giving way, because I am a little bit anxious he might forget Airbus, which is in Newport West, which obviously, in terms of cyber security, I am sure he would have mentioned it, but it is a really important part, as, as the Shadow Minister has mentioned earlier on, in terms of cyber security, but also the tech jobs within South Wales. It is a really vital part of our, our net network, if you like. I just wanted to remind him of that, just in case. Well, member. In fact, the, 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 the challenge is there are so many uh, businesses and companies involved in space, aerospace in the UK and uh, space industry generally that I can't list them all. But obviously, Air, uh, Airbus was mentioned earlier by the Shadow uh, Minister. It's clearly uh, Airbus and uh, British Aerospace, the two big, really, really big aerospace uh, industries. But one of the points uh, I want to make that actually it's not just those two big, sort of big giants, as it were, but actually there are many thousands of smaller companies and medium sized companies and the whole uh, supply chain uh, that are creating jobs and creating value and creating all these uh, uh, economic opportunities for the UK, which this legislation is designed to help uh, enable. Um, but building on the success of our, uh, the UK space sector, the government has set out bold spaceflight ambitions. This is the, the bold. This is the text I was given from officials. It's definitely bold. And you could say, in our national space strategy, the UK is boldly going where no country has gone before. Uh, the puns aren't stopping. And this includes making the UK the leading provider of commercial small satellite launch in Europe by 2030. As I said, that is where the opportunities are, the small satellites, not the, uh, not the big ones. And to achieve our ambition, the government has invested over £57 million so far through the Launch UK programme to grow new UK markets for small satellite launch and suborbital spaceflight. Now, many, before I come to the regulatory aspects of this bill, many, many of uh, uh, that my honourable friends have talked about all the commercial opportunities that I touched on earlier, and I won't uh, just talk about that. But it was what was interesting uh, with the Odysseus robot landing on the moon yesterday is that it was the moon. That, uh, why, uh, why go to the moon? And really, I'm trying to paint the bigger picture here rather than the immediate uh, commercial opportunities, because there are lots of people uh, who see opportunities for further um, uh, space expansion uh, um, development. So Elon Musk has said. Uh, he's obviously got a few achievements under his belt, but he has said he wants to die on Mars. Now, how, how realistic that is, uh, I don't know. But there are certainly uh, there are now plans to send humans back to. Uh, he's, he's, he's launched a Tesla into space. Do people know this? He has launched a Tesla into uh, one of his cars into uh, orbit. Um, the, the, uh, there are plans now to send uh, humans back to the moon uh, next next year, I believe, and, and plans to send humans uh, to Mars. Now, people, humans have looked to the skies, uh, obviously, since uh, from time immemorial and uh, dreamed of what w was up there. And, uh, um, uh, and it is in the human instinct to 
uh, to go and explore, and that's why we went around the earth. You look at the Polynesian culture, where they went from one island to another island, they set, they set forth in their boats without necessarily realising what they'd find when they get there, and it is totally the human instinct and ambition to go and explore the universe. And we don't know what we'll find there, we don't know what the opportunities will be. I don't think we'll find the clangers, I don't think we'll find a suit dragon on, a, on, a, uh, on some other planet. I'm, I'm very happy to give that. I never thought I'd actually intervene on the word clangers, but there we are. <laughs> Um, I, uh, thank you for, ta- for, for giving away. I, in, I chair the all-party group for critical minerals, and obviously critical minerals is another huge uh, in, industry in Cornwall. Uh, but as we know, globally, certainly from the friendly nations that we can trust, we still don't have enough to see what to, for our supply for the future. Um, does he agree with me that actually space could potentially, in the future, in future generations, be another source of critical minerals for the, for the supply chain that we need? I thank, I thank my honourable member for that point, because uh, it is very well, uh, very well made, that actually... Uh, the reason why um, uh, the Odysseus robot went to the south pole of the moon is because that's where the supply of water. And water is obviously not a critical mineral, but actually it's a source material for uh, energy and obviously oxygen, uh, and you can get hydrogen uh, out of it. Uh, but actually the reason why commercial companies are inter- and indeed governments are interested in the moon and Mars is exactly that, because of critical minerals. That we, are, we have limited supply of those minerals uh, uh, on Earth, but we may be able to find them in uh, other places. I'm very, very happy to wait for the moment. Um, whilst, we're, whilst we're waiting to get to infinity and beyond, I think it's important. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, think, I think it's important to, to, to highlight some other very, very in, uh, in, innovative uh, British companies that are looking at doing extraordinary things on the critical mineral point, where they're seeking to uh, take the lunar regolith, the, lunar, the moon dust, which is, uh, which is an oxide of uh, a metal oxide, and take that using robots to not only create um, 3D printing powder, where you can actually print a moon base through 3D uh, additive uh, printing, but also the byproduct is oxygen. And given the fact that it costs a uh, million dollars per kilogram to get a payload to the m- surface of the moon, actually, when you think about not just the breathing oxygen, but also the energy and the propulsion, um, uh, the, the oxidants that you need for propulsion, it is extraordinary what British companies are doing that is going to make it possible that we can, we can not only get to the moon and, and occupy it, but also use the moon as a launch pad to get onto further places like Elon Musk's uh, ambition to get to Mars. The Americans need us. I think we should remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My honourable friend for that intervention, because he does indeed make, uh, uh, expound on a very important point that we are actually critical to space industry and space uh, exploration uh, more generally. So, coming back to the regulation, coming back down to earth <laughs> from our big, uh, big visions and the clangers and so on. Um, we also put in place, the government put in place, we've been funding um, uh, the industry, we put in place the Space Industry Act 2018, which the Honourable uh, Member for Working uh, in his uh, speech uh, talked about, uh, and appointed the Civil Aviation Authority as a space flight regulator, so that's why I'm here as a, as a Transport Minister rather than the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology Minister, that sp- space flight, uh, to get up into space and orbit is a, is a DFT uh, responsibility. Uh, the, the Civil Aviation Regulator which is licensed sacks of water, for example, enables the licensing of space flight activities from the UK, such as operating a satellite in orbit and enabling launch to orbit from UK spaceports for the first time. Now, the government recognises that the question of liability and insurance is of utmost concern to the space sector, and that is obviously the entire point of this uh, bill. In responses to consultation on the then draft space industry regulations in 2020, and the government called for evidence to inform orbital liability and insurance policy in October 2021, the industry have made clear that holding unlimited liabilities will have an adverse effect on UK spaceflight industry. And I should, one thing I'd just like to point out about these consultations, because sometimes people object to peer, private members' bills because they're not based on consultations. This has been endlessly uh, consulted on and negotiated with uh, industry, and the industry are calling for it. Now, industry have advised that it's impossible, uh, not just difficult, but impossible to obtain insurance from, for an unlimited amount. And you might ask, well, why is that? If it's an infinitesimally small uh, um, uh, chance of something happening. Uh, and the reason is that for the actors, it's, it's impossible for them to quantify it because sort of infinity over infinity, you, it could, you could come up with any value. But also the insurers are required by regulation to be able to show they have the capital to actually meet any claim on them. And clearly, if you've got a claim that's potentially unlimited, you can't have unlimited capital. So it's basically, it is uh, regulatory and legally impossible for insurance companies to uh, uh, insure an unlimited amount by that. And so if you can't, uh, if you 
can't guarantee that you can ensure the launch of a rocket, then it's very difficult to go to investors to say, please give me money to fund the launch of a rocket, even though I may not be able to uh, actually ensure it. So actually the train is that we need the uh, liability limitations so the launch companies and other space operators can get the insurance and therefore they can get the uh, investment. Um, if you can't get unlimited insurance, you also can't get insurance uh, at all, full insurance for it. Um, so now, if the government did not limit a spaceflight operator's liability, spaceflight companies' investors would instead look to a more favourable regulatory regimes in other countries, and several honourable members have touched on this, where governments do indeed share the risks involved by limiting an operator's liability by offering a state guarantee. And they already do this in the United States, uh, obviously, and in France uh, with the French Guyana. Now, as my honourable friend uh, has explained, there are powers in the Space Industry Act that we can and do use to limit a spaceflight operator's liability when carrying out spaceflight activities from the UK. Current government policy is that the regulator should use these powers and specify a limit on operator liability in the licence so that no operator will face unlimited liability. That is the government policy at the moment, but it's set out in law uh, that they may do that rather than they must do that. And the government fully supports this bill for two key reasons. It is consistent with our policy that all spaceflight operator licences should have a limit on liability. It will not, therefore, impose any additional liability or risk on UK taxpayers compared to the current policy. And that was a point that the Honourable Member from Woking uh, made. There is no increased risk to, to taxpayers, UK taxpayers from this bill. Um, the government also recognises the value the industry places on having legislative certainty on this matter. As I pointed out, the investors need to know, if they're going to make an investment in a, a space company, that their space company will be able to get uh, insurance. The Task Force for Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform report, the TIGA report, I think for short, published in May 2021, expressed concerns from the space sector about the use of the word may in section 12.2 of the space Industry Act, and this bill replaces that may with a must. Now, I want to uh, thank uh, all my various uh, honourable uh, friends for their uh, contributions. I mean, the the uh, member for Wild Forest he explained his uh, great interest in uh, space and uh, uh, mentioned uh, financial services. And I want to come to that because there's a point really, really uh, well made that uh, obviously. Uh, the UK was, before we were a, a spacefaring nation, we were a seafaring nation, and we obviously uh, uh, had uh, London was the main uh, port in the world, the biggest port in the world for over 200 years, and it led to a whole uh, maritime industry like Lloyds in London with insurance around it and uh, lawyers. And I'll let, come to the Honourable Member in a minute, one, one second. Uh, and, uh, and we've got a huge maritime industry here in London as a result of the, the, the fact that we had a, a, a a maritime uh, fleet, and the same opportunity uh, comes from space as well. And we can have space investors, and I've met some of them, space lawyers, space insurance companies, uh, regulatory experts, and so on. And that it is a huge opportunity. The government does need to make, and the regulators do need to make sure that the industry has the right incentives. And I'll give way to the honourable member. It's, it's literally just on that point. He mentions ports. Um, obviously, quite a few of our maritime assets are considered critical national infrastructure. I was wondering if any discussion had been had as to whether or not our space assets will also fall into that category. Um, in particular, if we, for example, are going to launch a 3D printer to build on the moon, which is apparently the only place Liberal Democrats won't try and block house building. <laughs> Well, that, 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 the, my honourable friend makes a very interesting, uh, raises a very interesting question there, and uh, I will raise it with uh, officials and come back to him with uh, an answer. Now, the, my, my honourable friend from Truro and Falmouth gave uh, um, a, a, a most fantastic and enth an enthusiastic speech about the space opportunities for Cornwall. And I bet most people in Britain don't realise quite how important space is for uh, uh, Cornwall. Um, all the different, the 150 different companies. I had no idea that uh, Cornwall had its own space lawyers. That's a great. Um, a great uh, uh, insight, uh, and also the use of satellites for, on maritime and, and the various other aspects in Cornwall. Um, and I agree that the. I just want to make sure that, uh, that the honourable member knows that, I, as the yeah, government minister responsible, I fully agree that the, the Cornish launch before my time as minister, but it was absolutely uh, a success from a regulatory point of view, from an investor point of view, uh, that actually the whole regime worked. And most, and the honourable member from uh, uh, Wire Forest uh, made this point that we tend to, in this country, we tend to overemphasise the negative and we say we always look at the, 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 the bad things that happen. But I think I'm right in saying that the first three launches from uh, SpaceX, that they didn't get in space, but they were contribute. They were uh, they they failed from a, 
uh, to, to get up, but actually they were seen as successes because they got the whole launch operation and lots of, uh, um, lots of um, uh, things were learnt about it. And the same is true of the uh, Cornish launch. Um, and I finally want to... Um, I'll, I'll happily give one. It, it was just to put on the record, because I don't think I said it earlier, the Cornish launch did actually make it to space. Uh, and it was, the, it was the secondary bit of it, which, which is when the, the fuel problem happened and it went wrong. But we did launch did successfully from, from British soil and it did make it to space. <laughs> I'm the, uh, the Cornish space launch uh, in that way, and I fully accept the point that she said. Um, and, it, and it's great to hear that actually Cornish children are uh, so inspired by uh, space now. And there is, as we've heard, there are huge commercial opportunities there, job opportunities, and I'm sure it'll be, uh, there'll be many, many great careers that uh, uh, will come from children having an interest uh, in space. And I want to thank my friend from uh, Haywood and uh, uh, Middleton for his uh, just general huge enthusiasm and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and countless puns which have livened up this day and we could all do with a bit of uh, levity. Uh, and, uh, and I thank the Shadow Minister uh, responsible for his uh, great speech and some of his puns as well, uh, and for his call for me to resign. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and the fact that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the opposition, uh, as I understand it, support, uh, support this uh, bill. Um, so I want to uh, finally say uh, I'm grateful for my honourable friend uh, for this bill, which is amending section 12.2 of the Space Industry uh, Act. Uh, and we will meet a key request from the sector, as well as address a recommendation made by the Task Force for Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform. And indeed, by turning that one word may into a must, uh, this bill will enable Britain's space industry to reach the final frontier and beyond. Thank you. With leave of the House, Mr Lord. <clears throat> With the leave of the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I thank uh, honourable members from all sides of the House for coming to this debate. Uh, and I thank uh, all colleagues across the House for uh, their support. Um, in particular, I, I would like to uh, thank my uh, honourable friend for Wa Forest, uh, who so ably and knowledgeably chairs the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Space. Uh, and in his wise and interesting speech, he touched on many things, but in particular uh, how uh, important uh, the growing space industry is and can be to our financial and insurance sectors. Uh, and I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, point to bring out. Uh, my uh, honourable fr friend, the member for uh, Truro and, and Falmouth, made a, a passionate and eloquent uh, speech, uh, particularly pertaining, obviously, to how the space industry is already uh, changing Cornwall for the better, adding to the Cornish economy with uh, huge amounts of scope uh, for future uh, growth and engagement as well. And I was particularly taken by her points about how school children and students in particular are really getting infused by the, the space industry. So I, I thank her for her support. Um, uh, my honourable friend for, for Haywood and Milton in a very witty and engaging uh, speech num uh, uh, alighted on a number of, uh, of interesting and important points, uh, but particularly how our legal services industry, the legal sector, can and will benefit from a, a growing space industry. Uh, and I am extremely grateful to the Shadow Minister and the Minister for their support for this bill. Um, as you'd expect, they were masters of their brief and spoke with great insight, on it, but also enthusiasm yeah. about this growing industry uh, and about the, uh, the help that this bill will give it. So for that uh, dynamic and innovative, growing future for our space industry, I urge this House to support this bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is that the bill be now ready second time. As many can say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The yeah, 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 yeah. ayes have it. I don't know if that makes you a space lord now, sir. Oh, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. Irrespective of, congratulations. <laughs> or, or, or a space cadet. <laughs> we'll now move on.